My name is San Jacob Tai, I'm a consultant cardiologist in York, and today's video is on the subject of heart stents, intracoronary stents. In this video, I will talk about what stents are, why they're used, and what benefits and risks are associated with their implantation. So, the first thing to understand is that for most of us, as we get older, the major risk to our health will be progressive wear and tear in our heart arteries, in our coronary arteries. And there are two problems with this process. The first is that as the wear and tear progresses, uh, there will be progressive narrowing of parts of the heart arteries, which then means that it becomes more difficult for the blood to get to where it is needed, especially at times of increased demand. And therefore the muscle cells which need this increased amount of blood will suffocate and thereby manifest with symptoms of chest discomfort or breathlessness. This is called stable angina, when blood isn't getting through quick enough to supply the heart's demands um, because of a narrowing and then that leads to chest discomfort on exertion, breathlessness on exertion, which is known as stable angina. So that's one problem. The second problem with wear and tear in the blood vessels is that the vessel becomes more prone to blood clots forming acutely within the blood vessel. And um, when a blood clot forms, you know, it will block, it can block the vessel, causing acute suffocation of the heart muscle. This is called unstable angina or a heart attack. So with stable angina, what tends to happen is that you're fine when you're just sitting, but if you increase the demand uh, on the heart, then the supply fails to match the demand, and that's where you get chest discomfort, and that chest discomfort occurs on exertion. With a clot, a blood clot, what happens is that maybe there's no warning at all. You know, you're just, you're fine when you're doing things. But then one day, as you're just sitting there, a blood clot can form and that blood clot can acutely block the blood vessel off. And that results in a sudden heart attack or angina. And those are both problems that result as a, um, as a consequence of this wear and tear in the blood vessels. Now, in the old days, when you developed a narrowing when the patient developed a narrowing in their blood vessels uh, and was complaining of angina the only way to treat this angina was either using medications or open heart surgery and whilst medications were able to reduce the demand of the heart or transiently open these blood vessels up thereby relieving symptoms the medications did not really fix the narrowing the narrowing was still there all the medications were doing were slowing the heart down so that the heart didn't ask for as much blood or even transiently opening up the blood vessels a little bit so that blood could get through. But that opening up of blood vessels was only present whilst the medications were working and then it would close down again. So the only other option for, in terms of actually trying to fix the problem well, was surgery, which was a major undertaking with the need to cut the chest open under a general anesthetic. The surgeon would then have to take another blood vessel from the leg and then attach that on either side of the narrowed blood vessel to bypass the narrowing. The problem was not every patient was fit enough to undergo surgery and there was also a limitation in that the narrowing had to be in a big enough blood vessel for the surgeon to be able to stitch the bypass onto that blood vessel. If the blood vessel was uh, very, very small, then it would, may not be physically possible to bypass that blood vessel. And given these limitations, scientists became increasingly interested in seeing if there was a way of accessing the narrowed blood vessels without the need for open heart surgery. And the breakthrough came in 1953 when a Swedish radiologist, Dr. Seldinger, developed a technique known as the Seldinger technique, which made it possible to access internal blood vessels from the outside without actually cutting the chest open. And what he um, postulated was that because we can feel arteries, every artery is in communication with the heart. So if you could puncture an artery, which was externally palpable, then you, and you can feel them in your wrist, in your groin, then you could introduce a thin wire through a needle 
into this artery and used x-ray guidance to move this wire all the way up from the artery all the way to the heart. If you could then slide a tube up the wire and remove the wire, then it would be possible to inject radiopaque dye, for example, into the blood vessels uh, and actually into the blood vessels of the heart because if you really go far enough, eventually every artery will lead to the heart and from there you can access the heart arteries. And you could then inject radiopaque dye into these blood vessels and take x-rays and thereby it would be possible then to identify the location of the narrowings that were causing the patient the problem. That procedure, that procedure of going in from the outside and injecting dye into the heart arteries to see where the problem was, was called coronary angiography. And once doctors became comfortable with the practice of angiography, the next challenge and goal was to develop a way of using the same method to deliver some kind of treatment to open up the narrowing. And in 1977, a German cardiologist called Dr. Andreas Grunzig was able to perform the first angioplasty, where he was able to access the narrowings and then use a balloon at the end of a catheter. So he would go in with a wire, access the narrowing, so he could see on the x-ray where he was, access that narrowing, and then he would slide a balloon over this wire, and he would then inflate the balloon in the narrowing. And the effect was that that would then stretch open the narrowing with very good results. And this was obviously a huge breakthrough. And doctors started developing experience and expertise in this technique, which was called balloon angioplasty. As more procedures were done and research on long-term outcomes started becoming available, it became apparent that up to 30% of patients would redevelop symptoms due to a re-narrowing within that blood vessel that had undergone the balloon angioplasty. And therefore, they would often require a repeat procedure. And this was thought to be due to three factors. You know, why would that balloon narrowing recur after you'd stretched it open? And it was thought that there were three factors at play. The first was that there was recoil of the stretch segment, so acute recoil, so you stretch it and then uh, there's recoil and that could cause the re-narrowing. Uh, there was also something called negative remodeling of the stretch segment, so the bit that you'd stretch would undergo change and that could cause um, remodeling and cause that narrowing to redevelop. And then there was uh, also the possibility of growth of tissue within the stretch segment. And to try and improve on this, scientists became interested in the idea of developing a stent, a metal stent, which could then be implanted within the narrowing. And this would then hold the vessel open and reduce the risk of restenosis by reducing the chances of elastic recoil, because the blood vessel couldn't recoil if you had a metal stent sitting in there holding it open, and also negative remodeling. Uh, however, growth of tissue within the stent would still be feasible. And this then led to the development of first-generation intracoronary stents. These are, called bare, these are now called bare metal stents. And it was noted that indeed bare metal stents were twice as effective as balloon angioplasty in terms of reducing risks of stenosis. Let me show you a stent. I got this. Um, this is a... Uh, this is what a stent looks like. Let me just show it to you. I'm not sure whether it'll show up as clearly on the video, but this is the wire that goes into the patient. Okay, so this goes up the blood vessel all the way to the heart. And here is the stent. Can you see? There is the stent, just there. And I can actually move it. Can you? So this is what we're talking about here, this tiny metal stent. Uh, I'll try and take some uh, closer pictures and post them. Uh, but this is the stent that goes into the heart artery. So this is on, uh, mounted on a balloon. So what you would do is you would put this thing into the um, narrowed segment, blow the balloon up. The balloon would blow, the stent would expand, and then you deflate the balloon, but the stent stays there and keeps that blood vessel open. So this is what we're talking about. This is as tiny as they are, you see. Um, anyway, so they found that uh, when you put stents in, uh, stents were twice as effective 
uh, as balloon angioplasty in terms of reducing the risk of renarrowing or restenosis. However, despite this improvement, up to 15% of patients would still develop restenosis within a year because of growth of tissue within the stent. So, you know, you put the stent in, it prevents a recoil, but you could still grow new tissue within the stent and that could re-narrow the area. And, to, and this was called, again, so this was restenosis again, in stent restenosis, much better than previously when you didn't have a stent, but you could still have it. And to try and reduce this risk of instant restenosis, scientists found that if they could coat the stent with some form of medication, which was released over uh, a few months, between 2 and 12 weeks, then that could reduce the proliferation of cells within the stent, and that would then reduce the risk of restenosis. And this then led to the development of what are now known as drug eluting stents. And these stents tend to be coated with a type of antibiotic and an antiproliferative agent, which then prevents new growth within the lumen of the stent. While these stents were significantly more effective at preventing new growth of abnormal tissue and therefore reduced the risk of restenosis by a further 50%, the problem was that they were so good that they would not allow the patient's normal tissue to embed the stent. And therefore, a significant amount of the foreign surface of the stent remained uncovered. And this then acted as a surface where blood could clot, and it became apparent that there was a significantly higher risk of sudden blood clots forming on this exposed surface of the stent and that would then block the stent off, and this was called late stent thrombosis. And late stent thrombosis is a potentially catastrophic complication as the patient is asymptomatic one minute and then suddenly out of the blue, the stent is blocked and the patient has had a major heart attack. With further advancements, stent designs have become a lot more sophisticated and now stent thrombosis is an uncommon problem. It is nevertheless still a potentially very dangerous complication. Whilst the prevalence of stent thrombosis is 1-2%, to 2 the mortality rates in acute stent thrombosis can be as high as 20-40%. to 40 And it is for this reason that it is recommended that after a stenting procedure, patients are, uh, should take medications that reduce the risk of thrombosis. Uh, which appears to be significant in the first year and perhaps greatest in the first six months. The medications that are recommended are generally a combination of two antiplatelet agents, one of which is aspirin, and then the second is a, um, another antiplatelet, either clopidogrel, ticagrelor, or prasugrel. And whilst for several years we have used clopidogrel as the second agent in addition to aspirin, its use, especially in people who have had a recent heart attack, has been surpassed by ticagrelor or, or prasugrel. And it is generally recommended that these medications be continued in combination with the aspirin for a full year after the implantation of the stent. The problem with taking two antiplatelet agents is the enhanced risk of bleeding, but it is felt that the risk of blood clots in most patients is higher than the risk of bleeding, especially within the first year. By the end of the year, the risk of stent thrombosis has probably fallen to the point that the risk of bleeding is considered to be greater than the risk of thrombosis, and therefore the second antiplatelet is usually discontinued by the end of the year. It is important to understand, however, that whilst a lot of what we recommend is based around reducing the risk of stents blocking off, there is another advantage to having the two agents in combination, and that is that they also reduce the risk of blood clots forming in the non-stented vessels. And therefore, apart from just preventing the stent blocking, they may also reduce the risk of more heart attacks in non-stented vessels. Uh, it is believed that there is a group of patients who are at a highest risk, who are at the highest risk of further heart attacks, and those are diabetics, patients who have kidney disease, peripheral vascular disease, and those who have disease in more than one coronary artery. And there was a study called Pegasus Timmy 54, which suggested that in these patients, it was better for them to continue on a combination of two antiplatelets, albeit at a lower dose, for a further one to three years after their index heart attack. 
There have been a bunch of studies looking at the risk of stent blockages in patients who have prematurely discontinued the second antiplatelet, and we have observed that more than 25% of patients who stop the clopidogrel in the first month will suffer a stent thrombosis. Premature stopping of the clopidogrel is associated with a 30-fold increased risk of stent thrombosis. And in one particular study of 500 patients, it was found that 7.5% of patients died within the first 11 months if they stopped their second agent, compared to only 0.7% who did not stop. In summary, stents have revolutionized how we treat heart artery narrowings and blockages. They have markedly reduced our reliance on open heart surgery, which was really the only option other than pills in the last century. Stents, however, carry their own problems, and the most important is that they are a foreign body and can therefore block off. And in that sense, cultivating a healthy lifestyle and complying religiously with the two antiplatelet medications uh, that are usually recommended for at least a year after stenting is crucial. So I hope you found this useful, and I would love to hear your thoughts, and I wish you all the best. Take care.